I'd like to welcome you to the AES Melbourne section online presentation for October 2021. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Graham Huon and I'm presently the chair for this Melbourne section. Uh, there's a couple of housekeeping items for you tonight. For the Zoom session, can you please keep your microphone muted unless welcoming the presenter and giving a round of applause to Joe in a minute or when asked to comment or speak. This helps with the background noise levels, as we've already heard. Also, if you can enable your chat sidebar, that's at the bottom of your screen, you can use that to prompt and ask a question. So type in your questions and send them, and then we can make sure that we answer them at the end of the appropriate time. Okay, well, tonight's session is entitled From Stradivarius to Speak at the technology for improvements in sound delivery and room acoustics treatment. Unusual to hear those two things in the same sentence. We're all familiar with a well-designed concert hall having clarity of performance with a balanced enveloping sound field and without hard echoes. We seek to capture this in our recording and in our listening experiences, but we must often put up with less than ideal acoustic environments at both ends. What if both clear delivery and the enveloping experience could be recreated directly from the loudspeaker without the need for a well-designed concert hall or listening environment? Would that be useful? Tonight, musician and inventor Joe Hayes, where is he? He's here somewhere. There he is, yes. Uh, tonight, Joe Hayes, uh, based in Sydney, Australia, will take us through the associated problems and then show us how he has tackled the problems head on to solve them. Joe Hayes is the CTO of Vastigo, hope that's correct, uh, Limited, and he's had decades of experience in, in, in designing and manufacturing innovative products for both musicians and for the industry. These include the Passac MIDI Sentient 60, uh, Sentient 6, Unity 8 mixer and EC1 equaliser preamps. He has teamed with Larry Fishman and Martin Guitars, amongst others, for the world market. If there is interest in the group, a future live demonstration of the technology will be arranged when we're able to enjoy face to face meetings again, because demonstrating these technologies does need you to directly listen. In the meantime, please join us to hear about Joe's new developments in loudspeaker design. Would you please unmute and give Joe a hearty welcome? Thank you, Thank you Joe. And uh, you can Thank mute again, please. Thank you, Graham. Um, I'll just start my presentation and share the screen. Please bear with me while I work out how to share my no, That's okay. It's no problem. <laughs> In the meantime, Joe's been uh, doing a lot of work here, but the combinations you're going to hear about tonight tackle the two problems of having good, clear, direct sound for what you want to listen to and having treatment of the environment in which you are listening. So I think you'll find it very, very interesting. And, and Joe's not one, he's not a, you're not really shy and retiring, are you? No, no, Graham. I, um, <laughs> I don't see the point, I guess. Of... Rightio. So no, I can't do two things at one time. So, so can you see a screen? Yes, yeah, that's working. Now let's hopefully it's um, the right screen. Yes, we've now got, yeah, that's it. That's okay. it. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, I'd like to thank the Melbourne section of the AES for inviting me to present tonight. Um, my talk is on Stradivarius to Speakers. And that title is taken from my journey, um, which I'll first after the presentation will go through. That I think is important to give an idea of how I ended up with the Dassault reality. And the second half will explain the technology. Um, so in the beginnings, improve, improving musical instrument performance. Um, that was my first love. So in the beginning, God created the universe, the earth, and Neville Teal. And I did my loudspeakers 
my, I did my engineering thesis on Neville Teal's work, a loudspeaker enclosure design incorporating a theatre alignment. So um, this is the front cover. Then I went on to study a Masters of Science Acoustics and being a guitar player, professional guitar player, I was really interested in the acoustics of um, the, the, the acoustic guitars. And one of the things I learned pretty quickly is the monopole, you have various pole modal vibrations in a guitar top. I quickly realized that this first monopole was a vented loudspeaker. Um, my thesis is where I learned the maths to solve the vented loudspeaker problems. So with uh, the industry at the time, they were putting a piezo pickup on the bridge of the guitar, transducing the cone, if you like, but they weren't transducing the vent. So I created this little box. I called it a pre-amplified split signal acoustic contour. I split the signal. One I kept untouched as the soundboard, and the other I created an artificial vent, which is this resonance here. The, the logo is from two different Q factors on the curve. And you dial up your sound hole resonance here and do anything from violin to a double bass. Um, the company was called you know, PASAC, which was the acronym for the pre-amplified split signal acoustic contour. And through it, I ended up working with Sting, Dire Straits, James Taylor, a whole bunch of musicians around the world. Um, and I guess they were all looking for the fuller acoustic sound of their instruments, the acoustic instruments when they were plugged in. So um, that was the EC1 by PASAC. Then I started thinking about these other resonances that, I mean, the PASAC vented loudspeaker is just appropriate for the monopole. Um, and I realized that these resonant frequencies tend to lie on odd prime numbers. So if you take the root number as being um, three, because uh, one is not a odd prime. So three, five, seven, 11, and 17, and choose a, a basic value for one at 50 hertz. So you get 150 hertz, 250, 350, 550, 850, um, and put a Q factor of 14 resonance on them. We found Q factor of 14 worked well for some reason. When you introduce a guitar harmonic string, you find that only one of those harmonics is going to sit on a resonance, in this case, the third. And the interesting thing is that you'd think that would sound strange. It doesn't. If you put an electric guitar through this, that whole band sounded warm and bassy, like an acoustic guitar. So this got me, got me thinking about a concept um, that there's something going on beyond what the electrical engineering degree will teach you about flat frequency response in that whole world. It's very much going into the psychoacoustic world. So it got me interested in psychoacoustics in a big way. Um, so we put that into a product. We put electric guitar in, you get an acoustic guitar out. Um, then we moved into guitar MIDI controllers where you would put a bridge, that's a guitar bridge, electric guitar bridge, you know, piezo crystal on each channel. You put it in a guitar, replacing this component, and out you'd get a pitch train. You get a, a signal from each string. Now, guitar string signals are very similar to heartbeat signals, strangely enough. They, they vibrate exactly the same way. So I've, I've borrowed a heartbeat signal here. Um, and you'd have six channels, so six pitch trains. And I started using this word pitch trains, you know, the, the, the team started using the word pitch trains, six pitch trains with the tech pitch. The problem with a guitar MIDI controller is you have to wait for one cycle to complete to work out what the fundamental is. Now, one cycle on the low guitar strings, low in pitch guitar strings, was more than 10 milliseconds, and that's a perceptible delay. You know, a musician would, would, would find it awkward to get a response 10 milliseconds after they, they plucked a note. Five milliseconds is acceptable, but not 10. So I was doing my coursework masters at the time, and the, it was the psychoacoustics of MIDI. MIDI is the Musical Instrument Digital Interface. Um, and what I learned was that 
at the end of that first cycle, pitch could be 90% accurate and you could change it to 100% accurate and you wouldn't hear it. Amplitude could be 200% accurate and you could correct the amplitude and you wouldn't hear it. So um, this was really interesting that it seemed that the brain was much more interested in pitch than amplitude, particularly in the early perception and understanding of um, a new event. There's a story told me uh, once that it comes from our survival instincts. If we're getting attacked by a tiger, tiger, we really want to know what direction they are and how fast they're moving. Um, and through that survival instinct, we've, we've worked to, we work to spatialize things first. Um, so I'm into pitch trains now. Uh, and I took some great learnings away from this period of work. Um, so history is odd prime numbers, pitch trains. Um, so let's look at getting the sound away from the loudspeaker and back towards the original source. I'm going to use a lot of images today. It saves a lot of work. This, this, is, this is the classic loudspeaker response. It's certainly the general expect, a point source, but it's time coherent. So I call it time correlated polar. And what that means is that the shape of the wave in every direction is the same. So you get these perfect concentric rings. Uh, and if we look at a point at a distance, I'm going to use jellyfish here as an analogy. If in that time correlated polar, this jellyfish is swimming the same way, all of its surround is moving in unison. At the same time, it, it has that swimming motion. So I want to introduce the Spanish dancer fish. This is what I'd call time decorrelated polar. It's doing exactly the same thing as the time correlated polar, except it's got a time delay. So every direction has got the same flapping motion. It's just got this um, shimmer as Toby Gifford put it. Okay, so let's do a bit of psychoacoustics. Direct sound, early arrival, and why early reflections and the reverberant sound field can muck things up. So pitch is king. I've learned now that pitch is king. I still really don't know what amplitude is, to be perfectly honest. But that's our reality sounds incredibly loud, given its technical level of input. Um, so this is a really important psychoacoustic test. It's done in the 50s. They had a noise source, and they put it through a volume control and a bandwidth control through headphones to listeners. They got a large sample, you know, big enough to make the results meaningful. And they said, look, we're going to ask you to open up the bandwidth and adjust the volume to compensate. And what they expected was this, like you increase bandwidth, the volume would increase as well. Well, that didn't happen. What happened was this. You opened up the bandwidth and they didn't touch the volume control. Kept opening up the bandwidth, they didn't touch the volume control. Then suddenly it hit a particular bandwidth and the volume just took off. This is called a critical band or a Zwicker band. The work was done by Edmund Zwicker. And it turns out that there are 32 critical bands or Zwicker bands from the basilar membrane into the brain in the neural system. And each band is defined by this critical bandwidth. The idea is that energy goes beyond the, the critical band, then it starts energizing another critical band, which is why it gets louder. And it also means that one pure hum, harmonic in a critical band is just as loud as the whole band being full of energy, which is interesting. That's probably why the guitar resonance, the active resonance system worked. Okay, so we have 32 pitch trains coming from the basilar membrane into the brain. I, I know about pitch trains. So um, these pitch trains, they say there are two neural firings in each critical band on each zero crossing. So if you want, these critical bands are one third of an octave wide, thereabouts in the mid range. And if you get noise and filter it by one third of an octave and have a look at it on the oscilloscope, it'll look sinusoidal with a bit of a wobble about it. So filtering broadband into that narrow band gives you a fairly predictive um, pitch train coming out of that band. 
So the effect of an early specular reflection in a room is it's going to interrupt the pitch train. It's going to cause that neural firing not to come at the expected time. It's going to suddenly jump to a whole new phase position. When, when you add two sinusoids together, they end up in a resulting in a sinusoid, but at a different time base or a different phase. So suddenly there's this abruption in the pitch band. And, and what the psychoacousticians, um, psychoacousticians say was that they call that spectral splatter. So the whole 32 bands of the ear suddenly get energized with a pitch anomaly a great mechanism for detecting the arrival of a first reflection in a room. The timing is going to give you dimensional data about the room. Um, and I believe now, I understand now, there's a lot more stuff going on, but it's a great simple mechanism as to why first reflections are really bad in a listening room. If you're recording something, those reflex reflections are really important. You know, you could be recording in a room for effect. But when you play it back, you certainly don't want to introduce a second set of pitch anomalies coming from the listening room. So early specular room reflections totally interrupt the pitch trains between the inner ear, the basal membrane, and the mind. And these are the terms I used as I was going learning the stuff. The mind, then I just called it the upstairs department because I learned that, you know, flat response doesn't really mean anything when it comes to a musical instrument. Um, and it does in reproduction, but not when you're creating a sound. And qualities of sound are all worked out by this upstairs department. And what I now realize is the reality perception system. If you can get this right, it'll, it's, it sounds just like reality sounds. Therefore, these interruptions from the listening room need to be managed somehow. Um, so, I'm going to do a bit of psycho, a bit of auditory acoustics and precedence effect. Precedence effect is a, a basic localization thing. And I'm going to throw in time delays to the first reflection, which is an auditory acoustics uh, thing. The, I studied my masters with the architects and they took psychoacoustics very seriously. And um, knowledge about this stuff was critical for you designing a recording studio or dare I say the Sydney Opera House, or, or whatever it might be. So I'm going to use a plan view. I've got a loudspeaker, and I've got the listener here. You get a direct sound, and I'm going to use this image of the Mona Lisa um, to represent image, sound image. So that direct sound, free of reflections, you get the Mona Lisa. But there's probably going to be a wall that's going to cause a clear early reflection. It's going to be diminished in amplitude. Um, if it's a drywall or glass, it'll, it'll be fairly even in its spectrum and fairly coherent as the direct image. So I've got the Mona Lisa sitting out to the side here as a fainter Mona Lisa coming from that direction. Now, if we look at time delays, if that's less than 20 milliseconds, you're still going to localise the Mona Lisa in front, but it's not going to quite be the same Mona Lisa. I don't know if you can see this, the hair's a bit disheveled, but it's the Mona Lisa, right? But something's not right. If we go to, say, greater than 20 milliseconds, well, maybe it's the Mona Lisa still. I'm not quite sure. If we go to, say, 35 milliseconds, it's going to be not very good rendition of the Mona Lisa. And in acoustics, if you've got 35 milliseconds to your first reflection, you've got a really bad really bad room, really bad room that no one likes. And people would clearly say it's got problematic acoustics. And if you go to about 50 milliseconds, you'll actually see two Mona Lisas. You'll hear two Mona Lisas, one from in front and one from this path where of direction of where the reflected energy comes from. So this is the echo threshold, 50 milliseconds. I'm going to have a short break now. Stop sharing the screen. Um, so that we can be, you can ask any questions on that from where we are so far. Okay, well, um, so yeah, in I know one of the top recording studio people in Australia who's since passed on, but he would go for a 20 millisecond one reflection and just try to have that one reflection of 20 milliseconds. It's the, the live end, dead end design studios. In auditoriums, Kramer's doing work where 
it looks like a rice paddy um, where each little 50 seats of audience has a wall behind them to get that quick 20 millisecond reflection. Uh, so Kramer Auditorium are really worth checking out. So, yeah, it's, it's a big thing. It's an important thing. All right, I'm going to go back to sharing screen again, if I can manage all this. You're doing well. You're doing well. Yeah. I can work out which screen to manage. In the absence of questions, we'll move on. So I've introduced these terms, time correlated polar versus time decorrelated polar. And the idea of a time decorrelated polar is you'd want to get something like the Spanish dancer fish, something that shimmers, something that has full energy in every direction, but not in a time coherent manner. Okay, so, um, so on this side, we, so we wrote, an, we wrote an app using MATLAB, and here we're running a Corellogram. And just to, um, Corellograms, for those not familiar with it, it's measure, it, they say it's measuring energy, and it's uh, looking, it's a correlation against the Morley wavelet. I won't go too far into wavelets, um, but this is a Rogers pair of Rogers conventional loudspeakers in a normal living room. You have the direct sound here. Uh, then you have a room reflection here, and then a, the second room reflection coming in here. This is 90 centimetres. This is 160 centimetres. And um, because they're low frequency here to high frequency there, you'll, they'll be broader in the low frequencies because the wavelet has length. But you can see the direct sound and a very clear wedge of energy coming in at these reflection points. So they're like ghosts of the Mona Lisa coming in. Where this is um, a Dassault reality speaker, where what we're doing is removing these reflections. Um, Toby Gifford, who's joined us tonight for this talk, he came up the, the he didn't come up with the word apodization, but he calls it apodization, or we call it apodization. The literal translation from Greek is to remove the foot, is the technical term for changing the shape of a mathematical function, an electrical signal an optical transmission or a mechanical structure. In optics, it is primarily used to remove you know, airy discourse by diffraction around an intensity peak, improving the focus. So we feel this is acoustical apodization. If you can remove the blurring, which is the first reflection, and I say the first reflection because recent studies have looked into the effect of the second reflection. They find that this first reflection really does dominate things. So if you can remove the reflections in a room, in a listening room, you've appetized it, you've brought it into focus. So um, it's a corollogram, the impulse response, and you can see the clear reflections in the conventional speaker. And to go back to the Mona Lisa analogies, you know, we've got the clear focus Mona Lisa here, and we've got a Mona Lisa that a lot of people would pass off as the original Mona Lisa, wouldn't know the difference really. And I say that because this is a three millisecond reflection. It's not a, not even a 20 millisecond reflection, but it has some effect. So <clears throat> this image is taken from our um, voice call article. Came out in the 2021 September issue. So you can get to it through voice call. Uh, it has the... Um, an intro, sorry, we're in here somewhere. That's our spotlight, that's our reality speakers. I've taken this image, um, Toby Gifford, who's with us tonight, rendered this image. On the left-hand side is a time-correlated loudspeaker, and on the right-hand side is the Dassault reality loudspeaker. It's a pressure wave of a 9K, 11K, and 15 kilohertz composite signal. Um, so on the left-hand side, you have the time-correlated pole of the perfect rings. If you like, if you look at the LP record, all the, all the grooves are in the right spot. As Toby eloquently put it, on the left-hand side, it looks like the LP record was left in the sun. All the grooves are melted into each other, and if I can find my mouse, you can see that there's, um, you know, different things going on, different interactions, because in each direction, 
the phase of these three frequencies is different. So their interaction is going to be different. Um, so let's go back to my love of acoustical instruments and why have I dragged Stradivari into this. If you look at the tripole here, which I have learned that a very serious musical instrument will work hard to get that tripole to have equal energy from each of those lobes. Uh, if you look at the violin, that's the tripole in this direction or, or that direction tripole. Um, if you achieve that equal energy in each lobe, you'll actually achieve a Dassault reality sound field. You'll achieve um, time decorrelated polar. And if my hypothesis is true that if you have, you can actually remove the effect of the reflections of the listening room in a musical instrument, that's highly desirous because you're going to hear a very loud and beautiful toned Stradivari or great acoustic guitar or whatever it might be. So we then started looking at Dassault reality and this is a, um, these are the particle velocity quivers or if you like intensity vectors um, of a Dassault reality loudspeaker. Um, on axis is here, and it's at one meter. So you can see we have the Spanish dancer fish effect happening where there is a time delay in the polar. And in this mode, there are different modes. This mode, is, it's basically rotating at the same frequency at 5,000 times a second. If you wanted to consider that a wave traveling around that one, one meter radius, that's how you could look at it. It's really, really important that these quivers work purely in the radial direction. Uh, Toby gave an AES paper at the Automobile Conference some years back where we give detailed modelling of these quivers. Um, and with Dassault Reality, it's definitely no tangential energy whatsoever. It's all, it's all in the radial direction. And really, this motion couldn't exist. If there were any radial motion, uh, sorry, if there were any tangential motion, this, this, this motion couldn't work because the laws of physics would be, uh, wouldn't allow it. So the only, the only way it can be this time on sync, because that at 5,000 hertz of one meter is traveling very fast, you know, it's traveling 10,000 meters a second. It has to be no tangential motion. So it is a point source. Okay, so, um, and in mathematics, a point source is a singularity from which flux or flow is emanating. Although singularities such as this do not exist in the observable universe, mathematical point sources are often used as approximations to reality and physics and other fields. So there you go. We've that's our reality seems to be a singularity. Someone will have to up to date WikiLeaks, Wiki, Wiki, Wikipedia, not WikiLeaks, um, that there is now singularities on the earth. So it's got this energy that's shimmering at each frequency, and each frequency has its own unique pattern because frequencies um, are different and have a different wavelengths. And this is best explained by looking at the pressure wave. So um, this is where we get this component of our logo, by the way, from this, this motion. So I then asked Toby to model 0.5 for one wavelength at 5,000 hertz. So we can look at what does this look like in the pressure wave emanating from the loudspeaker. And because it takes a fair bit of work, this was done in Comsol, I believe. It takes a long time to render these images. We didn't do the whole sound field in this instance. From this, we got the barber pole effect. And you can see that the pressure waves are definitely eccentric. Uh, there's an eccentricity to that pressure wave. Um, there would appear to be, say, a 90 degrees phase lag at off axis. And because this is wavelength based, every frequency will have its unique different shape, be it elliptical or whatever it may be, that it occupies in space. So if you change frequencies, suddenly the wavefronts are going to move to a different position as well. So it's got this shimmering effect. So if we look at the detail rendering of these three frequencies here, you can see that the combination of three different barber pole effects each with their own shape has created this very complex um, 
sound field. And it's important to note that these sound fields have identical spectrums. They both just contain 9, 11, and 15K. That's all. But you can see they're very different. Um, now, if we put a head to scale into the sound field, the sound coming from the speaker to that listener is deterministic. And deterministic means relating to the philosophical doctrine that all events, including human action, are ultimately determined by causes regarding external to the will. Quite philosophical there, but it means you can understand what's being played through the loudspeaker. If you look at all the other directions, they're stochastic compared to that deterministic. They, that is having a random probability distribution or pattern that may be analysed statistically, but, but may not be predicted precisely. So if we're looking for this reflection of the Mona Lisa, um, we're not going to get it from Dassault reality. The listening room is not going to give you any reflected energy, and particularly correlated reflected energy. Yes, there's reflected energy. It's totally decorrelated. It basically sounds like the diffusion of the, of the actual live recording. That's a really positive thing in auditorium acoustics. That's a great thing in auditorium acoustics if you can achieve that. Um, and now if we introduce the minutest phase change on any of these three signals, these patterns are going to change their interaction. And the effect you're going to get, if you like, a Leslie organ, you're going to get rotations in these patterns, which is going to cause ITDs and IDD cues, interaural time delays, interaural um, inter -oral, inter -oral time delays and interaural high IDs. I think I've done a typo there. Intensity differences intensity, are used for spatial. Intensity. Yeah, are used for spatial cueing. It's how we hear spatial cues. These early reflections, energy coming from a different direction is going to have a shadow from your skull, and you're going to get different intensities and time delays from these reflections. So any echoes in the recording and it caused this sound field to rotate. Great, uh, we've just created a sound field where um, the, the it's time decorrelated polar, so the listening room doesn't matter. And then when there's a reflection in the recording, it's going to rotate the sound field. So we've just created this perfect reconstruction of the recorded acoustics in your listening room and got rid of your listening room at the same time. Okay, so let's have a look at the Dassault Reality Platform. What, what do you need to do this? You need a driver array. This is the one used in the speaker that's over my shoulder. Seven drivers. Uh, you can use three, five, or seven. Odd prime. It's odd prime based. Um, that's a seven array, but we're only using five at the moment. I think five arrays, um, the sound we're getting is great. would be a good economical solution for... Um, Loudspeaker manufacturers, it's arguably lower cost than what they're paying for a tweeter at the moment. Um, we need multi-channel amplification. In the uh, in this table, we have, if we choose an odd prime of seven, we need four channels of amp. If we use five, we only need three channels of amp. But, and the bandwidth of this diffusion is 13 or nine, so they're both great bandwidths. So you can do one to 10K or two to 20K with either of them. So it's great for a tweeter, but you're into multi-channel amps. Okay, so um, go back 10 years, that would have been a problem. Not anymore. So here's a 4 watts, a 50 watts RMS each, with each channel having its own DSP suite technologies, these chips, which I'll tell you about in the next page. Inductorless technology, they've got rid of inductors. Uh, so champs are, amps aren't a problem anymore. And then you need the Dassault reality algorithms, which are, we've patented, of course. Um, and that can be incorporated into another chipset or Dassault reality standalone chipset. Uh, if we look at applications, this uh, the demo we give will be on these bookshelf speakers. That's a high-end speaker. Um, really, really have, pleased to how it stacks up against other high-end stuff with quality, but also we give you we give you the full space, which they can't do. The um, automobile infotainment market is another. We're really interested in partnering in that space. 
Um, there are new drivers coming out that really suit what we're doing. These are the Rosinato drivers. That's a one centimeter by 10 centimeter tweeter. Um, you could use five of them and make a great high end, um, high end speaker, you know, a big six foot tall thing. But, you know, if more higher odd primes give you better sound, well, you could use 29 of them in that tweeter. Uh, these are the U sound drivers. They're little piezoelectric speakers. This is perfect for smartphones. So you could have an array, a five array in a smartphone. Um, you probably have another one of these drivers somewhere in the smartphone to get the bass, because I don't think these would give you the bass. But imagine traveling, having audiophile and holographic sound, if you, if you ever travel for work. And as we come out of lockdown, that would be really, really desirable. Um, I looked at using these same tweeters we used in this high-end speaker as a concert PA, where I use 29 drivers wide. Uh, you know, using these air chips I'll tell you about the next page is 350 watts RMS. And the thing to remember if that's our reality, it sounds so much louder than a comparative wattage speaker of normal technology. Why? I don't know. That's what I think loudness is actually a, a reality perception thing. You allocate loudness as a learned habit. Um, I know in acoustics, you know, in the formal acoustics, loudness, we have some measures for it, but it's it's a difficult one. Um, but the more real it sounds, the louder it sounds, which inverted out means you don't need much power to get a big sound if that's our reality. We're looking at the amplification side. We, we're using these uh, Texas instruments, 5825Ms. They're great. They are uh, run from 5 to 25 volts, perfect for cars, marine, uh, great for our high-end speakers are using a power adapter, 24-volt power adapter at 180 watts, I think it is. Very good for a regulatory because it then becomes a low-voltage directive thing, extra low-voltage directive, makes it really easily on the regulatory space, um, which can be a big issue um, when you go to international sales. Then you can even, this is a, um, a Maxim. It's a, a 98357A or 357B, tiny little thing, three watts RMS with an I2S input, and you control the game by shorting out the center pin to one of these other pins. So between that and these tiny drivers, you've got your smartphone solutions or your pill speaker solutions. Um, the DAS or reality algorithms be on a chipset, which feed the I2S signals to here. And the good thing about these Texas chips is we can fit our DASL reality algorithm in on board the chips. So um, they're a great, great solution between the micro speakers available now on these chips. Uh, from relatively cost-effective components, you can get a very, very competitive high-end sound and get this beautiful hologram on top of that. So uh, thank you. I want to reiterate that there will be a demo when COVID permits. We've got these demo units. Uh, one great thing about the technology, because there are no room reflections, it, you can give us a glass chamber. We'll do the demo in it and it works in there. We won't be able to talk to each other, but the sound will be majestic in that. So we'll bring a system, set it up, we'll have a good listening session. Um, the other good thing about that, just as a CTO, is I don't need any code chambers anymore, which is also great. Uh, you know, these are a few contact details here. Any technical inquiries should be directed to tech at vestigo.com or business at vestigo.com for business. Uh, just to remind us, already the hell is protected by multiple patents in multiple markets. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Uh, no, we have two questions. Uh, okay, uh, quite amazing to see a whole... There's another amazing. question here about how sensitive is this technology to loudspeaker distortion? That was me. Amazingly not. It's really quite interesting that um, and it's been there all along that when I tend to listen to it at 11 um, with, you know, I'm a muser, I like it loud. And the, the woofer can be polling, if you know what that means. The woofer is just 
at its extremities, but the crystal clear top end just holds in there. And that's why I was happy. I, you know, I don't really know with these drivers um, whether our technology, whether used alone as a single driver, how good they sound. Because I always knew that our technology seems to completely um, dominate the distortion thing. We really seem to move distortion out of the picture. Uh, and that makes you think about what is distortion and what is the most important distortion. And I would say the most important distortion is broom reflections. Um, and particularly if they're correlated, and by correlated, if they got the same um, information, it, well, I'm not saying what the information is we're listening to is important or good or bad or anything. I'm just saying if there's an echo of that same information, it has a really deleterious effect on, on listening. All right, who was that? Put your hand up. Uh, there's another question. <laughs> from Jim, there's another question from Jim Barber. So th th this is really interesting too, Jim. In that um, you, it's it's not the same as putting a diffuser at the first reflection location. Um, the question is, thanks, Joe. Very interesting. Is this conceptually like having a multi-segment diffuser at the first reflection location? Well, I say no because we treat having a dash hour is like in your whole room covered in diffusers. Um, and there's two things there. Um, so treating your whole, so if you do it building a studio, yeah, it can have some merit. One thing I learned from doing my reflectors is that I believe that the RPG diffusers do not work because Manfred Schroeder, uh, I may have to edit that out, but Manfred Schroeder assumed in his original paper that the sound wave hitting it was planar. You don't find planar sound waves in reality. So they've all got an error. To get my reflector going, I had to allow for those errors. And the beautiful thing about using the circuit board construction is we completely remove all errors in this. Um, but also when you hear a Dassault reality speaker, you immediately hear this constant presence. And whether it's the diffuse energy and that slight um, Brownie emotion or whatever you want to call it in the air, there's a continuity, there's a continuity in the sound. And I'm I tend to think about first in, last out, where everything in the room is contributing to what you're perceiving. It's not the first reflection has a very negative effect, but really all the whole immersiveness of the sound field and the reality comes from diffusing the whole room. But particularly in making that sound field rotate when there's when there's a phase, slight phase change in, this, in the audio, the sound field is going to rotate and you get those incredible cues, like you're watching a movie and you can hear a pin drop and you hear every little nuance that's going on. So that's, to me, yeah. the DAS is the, is the elliptical sound fields. The all reality is the rotational sound, the rotation in the sound fields um, due to slight phase changes. Um, the follow-up, if, follow if I may. Yep. You may. You may. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Yes, I know. George Massenberg built a um, control room with uh, diffusers all the way around. A uh, complete sphere of, of uh, multi-segment diffusers, which would have been quite a fascinating experience. Um, I'm wondering how this might apply in um, a surround sound environment 5.1 or um, a uh, 3D sound field as well, whether you're uh, looking to put these in all positions. Oh, I'd use as many as you want. We have Honda R&D in the USA have a 5.1 system of ours. Um, the people at, uh, at the uh, Moore Park, the film industry there, have some 5.1 systems. Um, so, look, it's, we, just, we just give you the interesting thing with two of these speakers, and when we do a demo, we'll, we'll open with a recording of a park. You just hear the whole park. You just... It's just like you're sitting in the park. So, therefore, on the spatial technologies, um, two ways to look at it. One is, excuse me, while I just uh, get more comfortable. One is, um, it's totally complementary to the Dolby Atmos and the other algorithms, the THX algorithms and whatnot. Um, and, or the other side is, depending on what you want out of space, 
um, if you've got a reality recording, it just reproduces it so well as it doesn't matter. But um, the the thing with Dolby Atmos, I, I think, and I'm going to sit in on a presentation of theirs next week from the Sydney chapter, is it's object-based recording. So you can have a bullet go through XYZ dimensions past the listener. So it's always going to be great for that sort of thing. You know, the best sound I get through these speakers is a binaural recording, which is meant to be a headphone sound. And one way to describe the sound is like wearing headphones, a headphone sound, but in the room. And that is what you'd expect from not having that first reflection or any reflections. So um, uh, I personally don't like sound inside my head. You know, I know that the Singaporeans company creative have done something where the sound presents just in front of your head. Um, I like to have the sound out there in the room, and I think this would be great for the virtual reality headsets on gaming in particular, where we thought I've thought this through. If you turn your head in a virtual reality scene, you don't want the sound field to rotate. You want it to stay where it is. You just want the visuals to rotate. That would be close so head, to reality. Head, 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 head. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, and uh, the... But, you know, what, I, what I, I'm just so busy listening to Chicago blues, 50s and 60s, or Lead Belly or anything, it's as a musician, it, their presence is uncanny and it's, I just want to pick up a guitar and start playing along with them. It has that effect, which is really interesting. Uh, is there any is impact there... on the um, sweet spot, on the uh, typical triangle? Sweet spot everywhere. It's, it is. So we do measure a Gabor wavelet. And Dennis Gabor was the inventor of holography. And everyone's got holographic sound, right? Everyone's claimed it. So there's no point saying it anymore. But we're actually measuring Gabor wavelets. Uh, we, we, it's just like having this hologram. And if you've got a hologram, you don't have to sit there. You want to walk around through it, um, you know, and, and from different angles. If it's a band, it's you're at a pub, you don't go stand halfway between the speakers at a band. Or if you're playing a great Stradivari, Everywhere sounds great. So uh, it has that effect. Um, putting your head directly between the speakers is this incredible thing where you really do get the effect like you've just stepped into that room. Um, but there's a lot about this we're still learning. You know, I'm going to need a lot of academics to come in and participate in this because the most interesting for me, for someone who studied the psychoacoustics of media and therefore psychoacoustics, is to have a coherent reflection is the is the bad thing, right? Um, so, and irrespective of what you're listening to, that coherent reflection is the most dominant thing in perception beyond whether the thing you're listening to, it's much more powerful than whether the thing you're listening to is good or bad. You know, if you're making a musical instrument, you want to create a good sound. And then when you want to reproduce a sound through a sound system, you don't want to add any more contaminants whatsoever to that, but building musical instruments is very different from building sound systems, sound reproduction systems. However, I think I, hopefully I've shown the, the bond between Stradivari and sound system. I would suggest to the people build, trying to build Stradivaries, um, start using correlographs in a map lab and see if your instrument is putting out a time decorrelated sound field. And it's, I think maybe some academics will pursue that now and they'll find that Stradivari has a very decorrelated sound field. And Joe, that's why it happens. I, I, if I can make some comments uh, that might help Jim, I don't know. Normally you'd say, well, we want the sound to radiate out into an ideal diffusing room. Um, what you've done is achieve that at the speaker without needing to get to the room. Then if that sound hits a hard surface reflection, it doesn't correlate it. It stays decorrelated. So the, the boundaries of the room start to disappear on your sonic influence. Does that help? I think Joe went to sleep. No, no. Oh, that's certainly, I agree with that totally, yeah. That um, may help because he's, he's doing the what I call decorrelation at the source. The, the important, the, the magic here is that your head, you know, if you take the stereo sand, it's 17 centimetres apart, two microphones or whatever it might be. Your head is, is one degree or two or three degrees in the 360 degree polar. So there isn't, there isn't that much difference. There isn't any decorrelation happening in that narrow band. 
but compared to every other part of the circle, it is different. So there is no way you can get a reflected path with the same information. Good. Do you need to have this with every loudspeaker in a multi-channel setup, or can you have it with one or two? Um, the the you know the five point one spec says the rear speaker should be diffusing, apparently. So um, the I would use this. I would use this in every speaker. Um, it would be a ton of fun to do that, to work in that environment. Particularly what's interesting is the B-channel stuff, the uh, um, ambisonics, where you record four channels with a sound field microphone, a tetrahedron, and from that you can mix anything you want. And with ambisonics, you can put the XYZ coordinates of your speakers in and create huge things. So, um, you know, all, all I can say is that we have a modular Lego-type solution where whatever power you want, is no longer really an issue um, from concert PA down to smartphone. So, uh, but, you know, I have built a PA. Someone's got a PA and they say performing with it is fantastic. One thing I didn't mention is because of the, uh, the elliptical sound fields, if you like, very hard to get feedback because as you change notes, this, the feedback loop is just can't latch onto anything. So it has this incredibly high immunity, the feedback. Um, but, you know, we, 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 as we seek, seek partnerships in these different markets, um, we'll give them the basic knowledge they need to achieve their technology and, you know, what, what they do for now, they package it is for them to decide. I often think about a car. I think, is it dangerous to put this in a car? Because you just get so lost in the performance, you may forget that you're driving a car, you know. Um, so, yeah. Uh, okay, Joe, any more questions? Yes, we have one from Rod. Yes, uh, and Joe, you said you've done a, a concert PA. Um, how does the, the size of your system compare to a conventional one in terms of physical size of speaker systems, power consumed by uh, power, you know, amplifier wattage, electric, electrical power, all those sorts of things? How are they, you know, is it half physical size? Is it a 10th of physical size? Um, it's a, a fraction of the size and a fraction of the power. So hmm. the, there is, the, when, if you can reproduce reality like sound feels, loud, the perception of loudness goes through the roof. Hmm. Or, you know, That's what struck me. Yeah, and, and it means like out of a smartphone, you, be able, you can get that, if you're into heavy metal or doof doof music, you can get that effect even at really low volume levels. So loudness, I think, is a, is a, is a plastic memory thing. Loudness is, a, um, is something you learn, um, which is really quite interesting uh, from a psychoacoustic angle. Yeah, I'm, I'm just looking at it apart from that. I've been thinking of those things all the way along, but I'm also thinking about the, the green uh, side of things. If you were touring a concert rig, um, you know, Absolutely. all that so, stuff too. Well, here's one. There, there's an interview with, um, oh, I've got to think of a name, Paul, Paul, Piddle for me, Linda Ronstadt. Hmm. And she said, what did you dislike the most about your rock and roll career, your touring career? She said, turning up the venues that were never designed for music. That is what she hated the most, right? That's gone. So you could have a small compact PA, Rock up to any venue that you don't, they could have a 35 millisecond to its first reflection and woof, just get rid of the room acoustics, just take it over. Um, I personally don't go to many live gigs because I'm so disappointed in the sound. Um, because particularly of the, of the venue acoustics, and the other part of that is the LEQ 90, you're only allowed to listen to 90 dB for eight hours a day, law. Um, we can deliver at 90 dB what sounds like 110 dB from a normal system. So, it, it, look, there's positives everywhere in that, that respect. Yeah, yeah. I was thank you. to make that point, Rod, that uh, the European regulations for sound exposure are putting a ceiling on those levels. Mm. And this is giving you a subjective benefit. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Any more? 
I think they're all stunned, Joe. Uh, yeah. Um, I'm well, looking forward to hearing it. You well, know, that's that's the point I was going to raise. If you can give me a show of hands about who'd be interested in actually listening to this and to the earliest available opportunity, I think we got 100%. No, we didn't get 100%. But we, oh, good, we got 100%. There you go. Oh, and I've got formal hands, so thank you for that. Uh, that is fascinating stuff, Joe. I think your presentation doesn't show the amount of effort and time you've put into all of this work with you and your colleagues. I'm sure there's been an awful lot of work done uh, on this, but uh, now the fruit of your labours. Uh, very interesting for us tonight. I'd like you all to now take the risk of unmuting and uh, thanking Joe for an excellent presentation, sufficient to get him to come back and give us an actual demonstration at the first available opportunity. So if you can all thank Joe from, for that. Thank you. And uh, well done to you and the team. There's two members of the team here, I think. Uh, but yes, thank you very, very much for that, Joe.